Hello everyone, welcome to the third statistics lesson. In this video, we're gonna to try to meet the following objectives. First, we're gonna distinguish between randomized experiments and observational studies. Then we're gonna to try to understand the advantages of randomized experiments, and then finish by talking about confounding and how that can affect the results of an observational study. So let's get right into it by asking a question, which is usually the whole purpose of an experiment or a study is to answer some kind of a question. So what question could we potentially have? Well, maybe you're a farmer and you want to know whether one type of seed produces a larger wheat crop than the other. So here's a description of how one could design a study to determine which of three types of seed will result in the largest wheat yield. So we have three different types of seed. As a farmer, we want to make as much money as possible. So we're really interested in knowing does one of these seeds produce more wheat than another? Okay, so here's how we can set up an experiment. First, we can prepare three identically sized plots of land with similar soil types. Then we can plant each seed on a different plot, choosing the plots at random. Then we can water and fertilize the plots all in the same way. Then we harvest the wheat and measure the amount of wheat grown on each plot. If one of the seed types produces substantially more or less wheat than the others, then the scientists will conclude that it is better or worse, right? And notice that we've tried to keep things similar and consistent to where the only difference between these different plots of land is the seed that we planted in it, right? Similar soil types. We chose the plots at random, water and fertilize the plots in the same way. So this is really the advantage of an experiment. It turns out that this is an experiment. And this is the advantage is that we're able to control these things and keep them consistent to where once we get to the end of our experiment, we can pretty convincingly say that, well, since everything was the same except for the type of seed, we could convincingly say that it must be the type of seed that's resulting in this difference in yield. Hopefully that makes sense. Let's look at some important terminology we're going to look at some terminology, important definitions that are going to come up throughout this section. So first, the experimental units. These are the individuals that are studied. Okay, so in the previous example, the experimental units were the three plots of land. That, that's what was being studied. They can be people, animals, plants, or things. When the experimental units are people, they are sometimes called subjects. The outcome is what is measured on each experimental unit. Unit. So what were we measuring from each plot of land in the last example? Well, the amount of wheat produced. So the outcome in the wheat study is the amount of wheat produced. The treatments are the procedures applied to each experimental unit. So what did we do to each experimental unit? Well, in the previous example, we planted three types of seed, right? Three different seeds. So those were the three treatments in the last example. And keep in mind that there are always two or more treatments and that the purpose of a study is to determine whether the choice of treatment affects the outcome. Okay, so the purpose of the wheat study was to determine whether the choice of treatment, in other words, the choice of seed, affects the outcome. In other words, the amount of wheat produced. Okay, so in general, we have two types of studies, randomized experiments and observational studies, and the previous wheat study is an example of a randomized experiment. So the formal definition we have for a randomized experiment is a study in which the investigator assigns the treatments to the experimental units at random. Okay, so we assigned the treatments, which are the three types of seed, to the experimental units which were the plots of land, we did that randomly, if you think back to the study we described. Okay, so this is a randomized experiment, and now we're gonna look at two important concepts before we move on to an example, single blind and double blind. So an experiment is single blind if the investigators, so the people involved in the experiment, right, are aware of who has been assigned to which treatment, but the subjects are not. An experiment is double blind if neither the investigators nor the subjects know who has been assigned to which treatment. 
So if we have an experiment where we're trying to test the effectiveness of a back pain relief pill, right? And we have two different groups, one that we're giving a placebo, which we often call the control group, and the other that we're giving the actual back pain medication that we often call the treatment group. If the investigators knew who received the placebo and who received the actual medication, but the subjects did not, then that would be an example of a single blind experiment. However, if the investigators themselves didn't know who received the placebo and who received the actual medication, as well as the subjects, then that would be an example of a double blind experiment. So why differentiate between these two? Well, the double blind leaves less room for bias or for other you know psychological factors to explain our results right because there's a chance that if the investigators are aware of who received the placebo and who received the actual medication they can behave and respond differently and that could potentially explain at least some of our results when our experiment is double blind there's none of that happening right so it makes our results a little bit more convincing a little bit stronger so typically, whenever we can, we try to do a double-blind experiment. Sometimes we can't even do a single-blind experiment. Think about if our two treatments were medication and back surgery. There's no way for those subjects, right? There's no way for people not to know whether they got surgery or not. So in that case, we can't even have it to be single-blind. So it really depends on the context and on exactly what we're doing and what's available. All right, so now we're going to look at a randomized experiment and see if we can practice identifying the experimental units, outcome, and treatments. So here's the experiment. To assess the effectiveness of a new method for teaching arithmetic to elementary school children, a simple random sample of 30 first graders was taught with the new method, and another simple random sample of 30 first graders was taught with the currently used method. At the end of eight weeks, the children were given a test to assess their knowledge. So see if you can pause the video real quick and identify the experimental units, outcome, and treatments. All right, hopefully you've got it and you're ready to check your answer. Remember, the experimental units are the individuals that are studied. So in this case, we have two groups of 30 first graders. So total, there are 60 first graders being studied. Okay, so those are the experimental units. What is the outcome? Remember, that is what is measured on each experimental unit. So look at the last sentence. At the end of eight weeks, the children were given a test to assess their knowledge. So what's being measured is their knowledge. So the outcome is the knowledge of arithmetic. Okay, knowledge of arithmetic. Now, what are the treatments? Remember, these are the procedures applied to each experimental unit. There are two treatments in this example. There's the new method for teaching arithmetic, and then the currently used method, right? So two treatments, new method, and then the current method, okay? And remember, the purpose of the study is to determine whether the choice of treatment affects the outcome, okay? So the purpose of the study is to determine whether the choice in treatment, in other words, whether choosing the new method or the current method, affects the outcome, in other words, their knowledge of arithmetic. So hopefully you're making all these connections and understanding these terms. In some situations, randomized experiments cannot be performed because it isn't possible to randomly assign the treatments. For example, in studies to determine how smoking affects health, people cannot be assigned to smoke. Instead, people choose for themselves whether to smoke, and scientists observe differences in health outcomes between groups of smokers and non-smokers. Studies like this are called observational studies. So now this is what we're going to talk about, observational studies. Let's look at the formal definition here. An observational study is a study in which the investigators do not assign the treatments. In most observational studies, the subjects choose their own treatments. Observational studies are less reliable than randomized experiments. So let's talk about this how smoking affects health study that we want to look at. So let's go back to this example. 
if a group of smokers and a group of non-smokers are observed for several years, and during that time a higher percentage of the smoking group experiences a heart attack, does this prove that smoking increases the risk of heart attack? So think about this. Does this prove that smoking increases the risk of heart attack? So this may be surprising, but actually the answer is no. This does not prove that smoking increases the risk of heart attack. And here's why, and this sort of leads into the fundamental problem with these observational studies. The problem is that the smoking group will differ from the non-smoking group in many ways other than smoking, and these other differences may be responsible for the differences in the rate of heart attacks. For example, smoking is more prevalent among men than among women. Therefore, the smoking group will contain a higher percentage of men than the non-smoking group. It's also known that men have a higher risk of heart attack than women. So the higher rate of heart attacks in the smoking group could be due to the fact that there are more men in the smoking group and not due to the smoking itself, okay? And this leads into something that you've probably heard before, which is that correlation does not equal causation, right? And typically that's all we are able to conclude from these observational studies is that some correlation exists. We typically cannot claim causation. We can typically only do that with an actual experiment where we are able to control everything and assign the treatments. Remember in that first example, we had the same types of soil, watered in the same way, fertilized in the same way. We controlled everything and assigned the treatments, and that is what allowed us to say that the difference in seed is what caused the difference in yield. In this case, there are things we're not able to control for, and this is one example, this example with gender. Okay, so this example illustrates the major problem with observational studies, which is that it is difficult to tell whether a difference in the outcome is due to the treatment or to some other difference between the treatment and control groups. So this concept is known as confounding, and in the previous example, gender was a confounder, right? It's some factor that is different between the two groups that could potentially affect the outcome other than the actual treatment, which was smoking or not smoking, right? So because gender is related to smoking and to heart attacks, okay, for that reason, it is difficult to determine whether the difference in heart attack rates is due to differences in smoking or differences in gender. So this comes up a lot across a lot of different types of studies. Designing observational studies that are relatively free of confounding is difficult. For example, suppose to account for the differences between genders, we compare a group of male smokers to a group of male non-smokers. So now both groups are entirely male. So there's no difference in gender at play here. So gender wouldn't be a confounder, right? But there are still other possible confounders. Here are a couple I've come up with. Are smokers also less likely to get regular exercise? If that's the case, then that could account for higher heart attack rates, right? Are they less likely to eat a well-balanced diet, okay? Because if that's the case, then again, that could be part of what's accounting for the higher heart attack rate. So there are still other possible confounders. I'm sure you can come up with more examples. And that's what makes observational studies so challenging and so limited, right? Is that there are all these possible confounders that we have to take into account and think about. So. Here's the summary. Here's what I'll leave you with. In an observational study, when there are differences in the outcomes among the treatment groups, it is often difficult to determine whether the differences are due to the treatments or due to the confounding. So that's a good summary of observational studies, and hopefully you're getting the distinction between experiments and observational studies. With an experiment, it's more powerful. We can make claims about causation, right? bolder claims, stronger claims. With an observational study, we can't really do that. The most we can say is about correlation. We can't say things about causation, okay? So in theory, it would be the best idea to just always do experiments because they're more powerful. The problem is we can't always do experiments. And here's an example with smoking. We can't take two groups of people and assign one to smoke and one not to smoke, right? Another example I'll give before I end the video is something I've been interested in, which is class attendance. Does class attendance increase final grades? In other words, if a student 
shows up to class every day, are they more likely to get an A in the course? Does that result in them being more likely to get an A in the course? Okay, so how would we set up an experiment to test this? Well, we'd have to get two groups of students who are both representative of the population, which is hard enough to do on its own, right? Ideally, they'd be in the same class. Then we'd have to assign one group to never show up to class and the other group to always show up to class, which again, ethical concerns. We can't really do that, obviously, right? So the best we can do is an observational study. An experiment just isn't going to work. The problem is, what are the potential confounders? Because at this point, the link between class attendance and grades is clear. Those who attend class more tend to get higher grades. However, that does not mean we can say attending class causes students to get higher grades. We can only state that that correlation exists. So what are possible confounders that could be explaining this link, this connection? Well, it could be that students who show up to class are more likely to be organized, and it's those organizational skills is, part of, is more of the reason why they are successful in their classes. It could also be that students who always show up to class are, they take their education more seriously, and that could be the reason why they're succeeding more in their classes, right? So there's a lot of possible other explanations, other confounders that could potentially explain this connection, and it's really hard to know for sure, right, without running an experiment. So hopefully that made sense. Hopefully you got something out of this video and it was helpful. If you have questions, if you're still confused, please send me an email, come to my office hours, and that's it for now. Hope you have a great day. I'll see you in the next video.